This morning I want to speak briefly on the subject of the human heart because this is a summary actually of the entire Bible. These 31,102 verses of the Bible are capsuled in two things by the master teacher, to love God with all our heart, to love people. Upon these two commands hang all the teaching of the law and the prophets, all the word of God. The heart, as Ivan Q. Spencer used to say years ago, I remember in our church in Endwell in 1967, he said, when you read the word heart in the Bible, it is referring to our spirit, the very depths of who we are. In our heart are our deepest affections, our deepest motives. As a man thinks within his heart, so is he. And the choices we make, the decisions we make, all come from deep down in our heart. And we don't know our heart. And even David, who was a man after God's own heart, he later discovered some other things in his heart, which we'll talk about. We don't know our heart. It's deceitful above all things, but who can know it? And David later prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. He wanted to walk within his house with a perfect heart. So, let's start in Genesis 6, verse 5, to show where the real problem is. This was at the time just before the flood of Noah. The human race had become so corrupt. And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Thoughts come from deep within. Sin begins in our hearts. Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And in Genesis 6, verse 6. The Lord... It says the Lord repented, but that means the Lord regretted or was sorry at that time that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. You know, God is spirit. And you know, man is spirit. Man is a spirit possessed of a soul living in a body. We are a spirit, even more than physical. When you think of thoughts, imaginations, guilt, and all of these things, it's spirit. Motives, affections, our spirit. We are told in Colossians 3 verse 1 to set our affection on things above. Do you know that the word heart, singular or plural, is found 935 times in the Bible? Now that's just the word, but Set your affection, that's speaking of the heart. Literally thousands of times all through the scripture, the Lord is talking about what is really, really down deep in our being. Because that is going to determine the choices we make and it's going to determine our destiny. What is down deep in our heart. In Genesis 8.21, after the flood, this verse always has amazed me, the Lord said in his heart, he didn't say this verbally, he was something he was saying within himself. And you know, this is who we really are, what we say within ourself. But the Lord said within his heart, I will not again curse 
the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and so forth. But I was amazed as, as Moses was writing Genesis that the Lord allowed him to hear what God himself had said just within himself. What a close relationship to know the heart of God. The heart is the center of our body, actually. Now we're talking about our natural heart now. It pumps blood and life to every cell of our being. And that's why when our heart stops, that's the end. <laughs> but you know what we eat in the natural affects our heart. You know when you overeat sugar and other things, it can cause blockages, it can build up plaque in our heart. But you know, spiritually, the things we feed on, like pornography, you know, the, the people, I've heard recently that 50% of ministers look at pornography, and that 67% of marriages that are destroyed by divorce is because people have been feeding on pornography and such things. It's so important what we are feeding our heart. You know, spirits get into us through our eyes and through our ears. What we look at gets down deep into our heart. And it, then it becomes an act. The heart, you know, it says in Exodus that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart ten times. But you know, God would never do that to a good person. He would only harden a wicked person. And it also says 10 other times that Pharaoh himself hardened his heart. So God was hardening a man who was accustomed to hardening himself. God would never harden a good man. And I did a search one time of hardness of heart in the scripture about 60 times and every time someone hardened their heart or their heart was hardened, it never brought blessing, but exactly the opposite. Hardening the heart means to close our heart, to become bitter, to reject the grace of God, and to become corrupt. So what is deep in our heart? We don't know for sure. David was a man after God's own heart. But we find in other verses that there were, he went after one woman after another after another, and then it led to a, adultery and murder. David could have never dreamed that those things were in his heart. He was a, such a good man, but this is why he later cries out, search me, O God, and know my heart. Lord, show me if there's any wicked way in my life. Jesus uh, tells us about letting our whole being be filled with light, having no dark place. In Leviticus 19, verse 17, it commands, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And this is where hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness begin. It's down deep in the heart. And in Matthew 18, verse 35, likewise, your heavenly Father will do this to you if you f from your hearts do not forgive every, every one his brother their trespasses. And so forgiveness begins in the heart. But you know, as, um, when we look at Acts 5, verse 3, Peter said to Ananias, why did Satan get into your heart? And then in verse 4, in the last part of the verse, it says, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Sin is conceived in our heart. And as I've often said, the only good kind of abortion is to abort evil thoughts when they come into our mind and in our heart so that it doesn't grow and become birthed into an action. 
We want to, when, when thoughts come into our mind and into our heart, we want to abort them. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You know, no one goes out and commits sin. They've worked it out in their mind and in their heart first. And this is where we must stop, by God's grace. You know, sometimes we can't help thoughts coming into our mind. But by God's grace, we can reject them, abort them. The familiar passage in Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But who can really know this? We don't know our heart. And we've used David already as an illustration. Here is wonderful David, the man after God's own heart, who wrote so many of the Psalms, who was such a deep worshiper, who wanted to bring the ark of God into the holy place, who wanted to establish Mount Zion and the holy hill. And yet, I'd like us to turn uh, in 2 Samuel 5, verse 13. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. And so I tried to total this up, and there was about nine or ten altogether. But you know, that was, that was violating Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, where it tells us that a king was not to multiply wives. And so here is something else that was in David's heart. Do you know that his son Solomon had a hundred times more than ten? I can't believe this. Do you know, if we don't deal with sin in our lives, it's passed on to our children and it's even worse and stronger. But here is this good man, this wonderful man, David. And here he is, this man after God's own heart who later is falling into terrible sin he did not recognize some things that were in his heart. And it led to something terrible and even to the murder of a good man, a friend, to cover it. And then later to cover that and say, well, one man falls after another. It, you know, it just happens in, in the battlefield. But he had ordained it that way. In another stat, I was looking at... Um, 68% of Christian men look at pornography on the internet. Now, I'm not sure of stats, but that's, even if it's not even near that much, that's way too many. But this is where sin begins. This is what destroys the home and marriage and society is what is in our heart. What we look at with our eyes gets into our heart. And if we continue to feed that, it becomes an action. Sin is conceived within the heart. <clears throat> Another beautiful verse in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 30, where it says that God only knows the heart. We don't know the heart. You know, when I was in Bible school, 50-some years ago. It's just incredible, some of the classmates that I had that I thought were just extremely <laughs> wonderful and spiritual. And when I see where they are today, they didn't deal with motives in their heart. And it destroyed them. But God alone knows the heart. And sometimes people we think would never make it do. Because God alone knows the heart. I love what it says in Timothy. The Lord knows those who are his. I love that verse. Because sometimes we think someone would really make it and they don't. And sometimes people we don't think are going to make it do make it. But God alone knows the heart. And that's when you, when you go to choose a spouse, a lifetime partner. Lord, you alone know the heart. Whom have you chosen? You know, if we allow God to make our choices, we're going to have a good end. Amen. We cannot trust our own heart. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool, says the scripture. We 
cannot rely on our own passions, how we feel. Lord, how do you see this? So we have Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And then Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me, O God, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. And then we have that beautiful verse in Psalm 86, verse 11 where it says, unite my heart to fear thy name. Because James talks about those who are double-hearted, double-minded. And he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to people in the church, double-minded. Well, we love God, yes, but there's a lot of other things we might love. That's being double-minded double-hearted. Lord, unite my heart. David realized later that he had a divided heart. And he was a good man. We are told in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence. And that word keep means to guard or blockade. Protect your heart For out of it are all the issues of life. This is where all our decisions and choices and destiny come from, deep in our heart. Can you imagine that the whole summary of this entire book of God's word is our heart condition toward him and toward people? Upon these two commands hang all the teaching of the law and the prophets. Guard your heart with all diligence. In Proverbs 23, 26, we are commanded, My son, give me your heart. Give me your affections. Give me your motives, your desires. And we are told in 1 Kings 8, 61, Let your heart be perfect with the Lord. As Dr. Bailey taught us years ago, that perfection is something that is relative. Absolute perfection belongs only to God. But ours is relative. You know, when we're a newborn baby in Christ, you only expect so much from a little child, don't you? If you have a five-year-old that's acting like a five-year-old, that's a normal, perfect five-year-old. But if he's 15 or 20 and he's still acting that way, then you have a problem. But if we maintain a proper rate of growth and we are listening to what God is saying to us and putting his finger on, we are considered perfect for that stage of our life. So let's keep a perfect heart. Let's not uh, ignore what God is saying or resist what he is saying. But if we will continue to uh, listen to what he's saying to us, we can maintain a perfect heart. It's relative. But let's look at a major problem of the human heart, and that is the problem of pride. Obadiah 1, verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Deception comes when our heart is proud. We think we're more important than we really are. We think we're more influential and powerful than we really are. And that is what happened with Lucifer at the beginning It led to him being a thief, trying to steal God's position. The problem of pride. In Deuteronomy 8, 17, if you say in your heart, my power and my might and the the might of my hand hath gotten me all this wealth. Oh, be careful. No, it's not our great intelligence, our discipline, our hard work that has done this. It's God's grace to us. Amen. Do you know that pride is the greatest hindrance to revival and unity? I remember years ago, oh, it's been 30 years ago or so, I heard a prophecy, and I've never forgotten it. In the low place, there is unity. 
where each esteems the other better than himself. Now, when we consider Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul tells us that, to let each one consider the other one better than himself. Now, that's the exact opposite of competition and trying to outdo everyone else. This is the spirit and thinking of this world, which comes from the prince of this world who wants to be number one and wants all attention brought to himself. And I was amazed as I was years ago studying some of the problems in our 12 for, uh, corner sto uh, foundation stones, the 12 apostles, the tremendous spirit of competition, constantly arguing among themselves, who is going to be the greatest? So we read in, Ma in Mark uh, chapter nine, verse 33, and 34, uh, <clears throat> the disciples were, Jesus said, what were, you, what were you talking about along the way? And they didn't say a word <laughs> because they had been disputing among themselves who is going to be the greatest among us. Now listen, these are the 12 apostles, the 12 foundation stones of the church. Still, influenced by the thinking of this world, the God of this world, the spirit of this world. And this is the reason for no unity, is when there is a spirit of competition, pride, comparing, competing. And so the Lord took the example of a little child and also said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. So what did they learn from this? Nothing. So we go to chapter 10, verse 35 to 37. And James and John said, Lord, we have a request. Of course, mother was behind this, you know. We want to be at your right and left hand in the kingdom. And the other 10 heard this and they were angry. So again, he's saying, listen, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Become as a little child. What did they learn from this? Nothing. So we go to Luke 22 on the last day of the Lord's life. In Luke 22, verse 19 to 24, they're around the communion table. And in verse 24, we see what they're talking about around this holy moment at this time of the Lord's Supper. There was a big argument among them. Who is going to be the greatest? And again, the Lord is saying, listen, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn, become as a child, humble yourself. What did they learn from this? Nothing. But you know, a few hours later, they all ran in fear in the garden humiliated, embarrassed, broken, Peter cursing and swearing and denying the Lord, and then seeing their Lord brutally beaten and crucified. Fifty-three days later, on the day of Pentecost, there they are all in one accord, broken, humble, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. And I believe this is a key for unity in our churches. No more spirit of competition. No more comparing humble, esteeming others better than ourselves, preferring others before ourselves. This is the key to unity, humility. In the low place, there is unity. You know what the Olympics is all about? I have outdone anyone in the human race and history. I am the greatest. This is what it does when you win a gold medal. There's no one like me anywhere. It's to bring glory to myself, attention and honor to me. But again, the problem of being number one and drawing attention to myself. Another problem of the human heart is being offended. We are told in Psalm 95 verse eight, 
Do not harden your heart like they did in the provocation in the wilderness. Don't harden your heart. Things weren't happening fast enough. You know, I've come to this place where if I don't understand things, everything that God is doing, I have to say, Lord, you're worthy to be trusted. And you do all things well. And I live by this verse in Ecclesiastes 3.11 where it says he makes everything beautiful in his time. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand everything. You know, Job didn't understand everything in his trial. But listen, <clears throat> he makes everything beautiful in his time. Lord, I don't know how and when or where and all these other details, but I do know this, you're worthy to be trusted. And I know ultimately, if I keep my heart right by your grace, you're gonna make everything very beautiful in your time. And that's the way we have to live our life. Even when God often does not explain, and you learn from the trial of the book of Job that God did not explain what he was doing. We find in, uh, this is quoted in Hebrews 3, 8, do not harden your heart like they did in the day of temptation in the wilderness. To harden the heart means we close our heart. We become unforgiving, bitter. And you know, in the last days, this is gonna be a major test for the church because when we read Matthew 24, verse 10, after worldwide revival, then there is going to come Antichrist and he's going to sift out the wheat and the tares and it says that many will be offended when persecution and difficulty come. Many will be offended and hate and betray one another. Do you know why? Because there is no depth of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no embracing the cross. It's what's in this for me. Listen, we have to be deeply rooted and committed because of what's coming. Luke 7, 23, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Do you remember a king named Josiah? In 2 Chronicles 34, 27, the reason why he was protected in time of coming judgment, the Lord said, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before me, I'm gonna protect you. I'm gonna keep you and preserve you. So let's keep our heart soft and tender and not harden ourselves. Another proof of character of heart is how we react when things are difficult. Not when things are going well, but you know when Job lost everything he had, we read in that classic verse of Job 1, verse 20, that he fell down and he worshiped. It'd be one thing to lose all your business and all your finance in one day, but then to lose all your children too? That was too much for the wife. But Job fell down and worshiped and said, in effect, God is good all the time. The Lord gave me all these things. He's removed them. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, we overcome Satan by the word of our testimony. It's so important what we say when we're hurt, that we do not harden our heart by his grace. It takes grace. We can't do this in our own strength. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 3, we see this test coming for the church in the last days. That when the false Christ and the false prophet come just before Jesus comes, uh, that the Lord our God is proving us to see whether we really love the Lord our God with all our heart. It's, this is the reason why God allows false teachers, false prophets. It's to test the hearts of his people to see if they really love him more. So we're closing here, but um, in Proverbs 3, verse 5, we are told to trust in the Lord with all our heart and not 
depend on our own mind, our own understanding. Amen. In Ezekiel 36, 26, we have the promise of a new covenant where God is going to take away our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. May I just say that when we were students uh, 50 years ago, we had the idea from Usher's chronology that the church age started at the birth of Christ, from Adam to Christ 4,000 years. But you know, that really wasn't correct. The birth of the the church age did not begin at the birth of Christ. It started at the death of Christ when the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, when God's own blood was shed and opening up the new covenant so we could enter within the, the veil and have perfection worked out in our lives. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out. The church age started at the death of Christ and resurrection, not at the birth of Christ. And if the church age is about 2,000, that would bring us to approximately 2,030, but we don't make dates, give or take a few years. You know, we, it's very unwise to make dates. Well, let's love God with all our heart. Amen. And I think we're just about out of time here. But you know, those who attain to Mount Sinai are, are those who have clean hands and a pure heart. And this is the most important thing. Lord, I don't know my heart thoroughly. Lord, search me, cleanse me, give me a perfect heart. I want a clean heart and I want to dwell in your presence. And may the Lord put his greatness in us. Amen. God bless you.